was in America with Auckland and they fired me. So I had to come up with three bass guitars and a suitcase, which wasn't easy, believe me. No sky caps in them days. And uh, I got home and I went to see my manager to make sure the money was going to keep coming in. And he said, no, it isn't. And they should form your own band. So I, I was going to call it Bastard for about five minutes. But then he pointed out we probably wouldn't get on top of the pops with that. And I, I felt he was probably right, you know. So uh, I called it after the last song I wrote for Auckland, my road. You know. Pretty good name for us, you know, slang for speed for it. To be honest, I didn't really know who he was because I, I never liked Auckland, and uh, so I didn't really know who he was. He was just like Lemmy, you know, and everybody kind of like sucked up to him, went and got him changed, you know, when he was standing. So he, he standing at the machine, you know, and get some, get some change, man, will you? So nobody else would get, so nobody else would win all the money he'd put in there, you know. And I was one of the people who who would say, who would say, "Fuck you, get your own fucking change." <laughs> so we didn't really get on that well at first, you know. And um, <clears throat> but later on, we did. And it sort of became like a two-headed monster almost. He came round to our house to buy some drugs or some sort. I don't know. And then he got arrested for a deed on chewing all, you know, which was like counter to productive, you know. But but then he started hanging about, and he was he, he kept saying, "I'm a drummer as well," you know what I mean? I didn't believe him, but he had drums, so I thought, well, maybe he's dabbled a bit, you know. So he said, you're, you're a drummer, right? And you've got a car. Of course, much later on, I found out that he was only really interested in the car, you know, getting a ride back. Because um, he'd run out of supplies, medical supplies, and uh, he, his ride had let him down on the, to get back. So it was a Friday night, a weekend, you know, he offered to pay for the petrol, gas, gasoline for the Americans. So I thought, yeah, all right, and I'll, I'll, come, I'll come down and yeah, all right, I'll give you a ride down there. And he said, uh, why don't you throw your drum kit in there as well while you're at it? I said, well, well what for? Well, it so happens uh, that we're thinking of getting rid of our drummer. So I took him with me in his car with no windshield. So I pulled, it, I pulled this bird with a huge fur coat and she sat in my lap all the way. It was great. Oh, nice. And the fucking drive shaft dropped out of his car about three quarters of the way there. On the way back? No, on the way there as well. Then you got it repaired, then it fell out again on the way back. Anyway, there was a windshield in it. The heater, no, there wasn't. The heater wasn't working. There was no windshield in it, you cunt. So um, that's how that happened. And uh, it was like, I went in the studio and I actually got on Lucas's kit because it was already set up and everything, you know. And um, and uh, they played the, the fucking, they didn't, they didn't even play live, you know. They just, Tommy and I sat, sat behind the drum kit, put the cans on, and they just played the backing track without the, the drums on it, lazy bastards. Because <laughs> this was their way of auditioning me, see. He fell over, dubbed all the drums on that first album, which is really difficult to do. Like, and he did a very good job, except Lost Johnny, I think he was, which was still Lucas. I'd never even been in a studio at all, you know, so I was like, wow, this is fucking great, you know. Wow, did the drums really sound like this? Fantastic. So when you're feeling like that, you know, you, it makes you feel so much better. He went in the studio and started playing and Larry said, Lemmy, what a little cunt, he's perfect. After I played a couple of numbers, um, I heard Larry's voice. They must have pressed the talkback mic. Yeah, yeah man, what an horrible little cunt. Well, yeah, we got to have him. <laughs> Something like that anyway, so I was the horrible little cunt. And then we sort of fucked around for another, wasn't it, three weeks or something. And then we were rehearsing in London and Larry kept saying get another guitar player, so he went and got Eddie, who was working on a houseboat with him, converting him. We met past Eddie because I had a job working on a, a building a houseboat, you know, uh, just as a labourer, you know, in between doing other nefarious things. And uh, Eddie was the Eddie was the foreman. What a fucking Hitler he was, you know. I used to love fucking Hey, Oi, what you fucking doing? Get back to fucking work, you cunt. He'd be like this, you know, and this great long hair, you know what I mean? And he looked really, looked really mellow, but as soon as he opened his mouth, he was a mean son of a bitch. But I turned up at the boat at nine o'clock, and Phil was already there working, and he says to me, man, I've been here since six o'clock. That's when I first, re <laughs> you know, because we all did, we did, I took a little bits of this and that, you know, in those days, but nothing on the level that Phil was doing it. And um, I quite admired that, you know. He was so upfront about it, you know. He was obviously out of his head, you know. His eyes were out on stalks, you know. He'd obviously been up for God knows how many days. 
But it was fine, it was hard work and that's what I needed. It was a Scottish friend of mine that said, uh, hey, you know that he's a guitar player, don't you? I said, no. And um, then, for some reason, uh, the Scottish guy who became my roadie later on said, well, why don't you get together with him you know, and have a blow, because he's really good. And then he turned up at my flat and he told me that um, he joined this band Motorhead. And I thought, oh, you know, because I'd read about them in the papers. Because I'd read that, I'd seen in a bit of paper that uh, they said, Motorhead, Lemmy's new band Motorhead, your lawn will die if you live next door to this, you know, this thing and all that. And it caught my eye. So when Phil told me he joined that band, it was like, oh man, it's a name band. So Eddie came down and they were supposed to, there was supposed to be four of us. Well, Eddie came down, but Larry never turned up. I booked a rehearsal for the afternoon. I went and picked them up, all their gear and that in the car. You know, I had this old Mercedes, it was only 50 quid worth, but you know, we were all bombing down the road. And we got it all to this little room that was smaller than this. And uh, we got it all in there. We're waiting for Larry. So it's about three in the afternoon. We're playing away, you know, just jamming. We're having a bit of fun, actually. But Larry never showed. So they keep phoning Larry, say, Larry, where are you, man? You know, you're supposed to be coming down. And he never showed, so. So they phoned him about six o'clock, said, look, the rehearsal's over. He said, well, I'm still coming, I'll come. So I booked another rehearsal upstairs. We were playing all day. It was really going well. And Larry came in about seven o'clock with his minder and his, like, roadie, carrying his guitar for him. Played one song for about half an hour and then fucked off. Yeah, yeah. on his own. Yeah, on his own. So, like, there you go, you know. It was a Saturday morning. I'm sitting, I'm laying in bed in my flat. There's this banging on the fucking door. It's like, well, I thought the door was going to cave in. It's like eight in the morning. Well, you know, I've only just gone to bed, so I jump up and I get to the door and there's Lemmy standing there. And he's got a leather jacket in one hand and a bullet belt in the other. And he hands them to me. He says, you got the job. <laughs> and walks off. <laughs> so it was fucking classic, man. So I've done wearing my underpants, you know, thinking, fucking great, you know. I was over the moon. And it was great as a three-piece, so it was also good as a hairpiece, or a codpiece. But we ended up as a three piece as opposed to a hair piece or a cod piece or a time piece. The end. Dun, 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 dun. Phil Taylor screwing a bag of popcorn was gone. There was one. Because you would never believe it, would you, you know? Yeah, he dug a hole in it with a knife and screwed it. Bag no, of pop that, was a, that was an unsliced loaf. No, it wasn't. It was a bag of popcorn. Do you think I can't tell the difference? I'm not at home buttering popcorn, you can't. We were doing a marquee. Phil, Phil wanted to leave the band, as usual. Phil said, well, man, if nothing comes of the band, we might as well break up after this. So the fucking marquee was going to be our last show. Well, me and Lemmy didn't have anything else to do. I couldn't think what Phil was going to do. We were all too concerned with just everyday, day-to-day -day surviving, you know, like dealing a bit of dope, you know, to, to get to make some money to pay for the rehearsals or, you know, or, or having a, a job on the side as well, like I did. Lemmy never had a job on the side, of course. Although so. they'll probably tell you, you know, he was an expert carpenter and... <laughs> it's going to be our farewell geek. So I said, well look, let's get a mobile down at least to record the fucking year and a half we've been together and put something on the fucking tape, you know? And so, um, so we said to Lemmy, we said, listen, you know this guy Ted Carroll, don't you? And, um, and he said, yeah, yeah. I said, well, fucking phone him and ask him to put, send the mobile down and he can have the rights to the record. So he phoned Ted. And um, Ted said the problem with the marquee was they wanted 500 quid for doing a recording at the marquee. Well, well, you know, that was out of the question in those days. So it was all looking a bit grim. But Ted came up with this idea, and we were knocking about with Speedy Keen in them days. He'd just done Johnny Funders, and he was, I'd known him for years, Speedy. Uh, and he was hanging around with us having a bit of fun. And um, Ted Cowell said, well, why don't you go down and make a single? Well, Ted Carroll said he'd give us a, what was it, two days in the studio to do a single, one side a day. So we went in there and we did, I think it was 11 tracks in one day. We plugged in and we played the set, because we were pretty good at the set. So we did the set straight off. And uh, fuck me if it was, you know. And we'd been up all night anyway, so it didn't matter. So when we got there, we started. 
So we laid the whole album down. And then I came up to London, and you come back down to me, I think. And you're standing in the back of the room, popping. Rocking Ted, that's how he got the name. And then uh, he said he, he gave us enough time to put the vocals and that on it and the guitar, you know, because he liked the tracks. He then put us in Olympic to finish off a couple of tracks because they wanted a remix Motorhead. It was a funny story, man. We, we've actually crashed out on the Saturday night because we're so fucking gone. Well, Speedy and John, they've stayed up all night mixing. And we've, we've crashed out, I don't know, it must have been one or two, three o'clock, something like that. And they're mixing Motorhead, the track Motorhead. Well, we woke up some 10 hours later, or eight hours later, and they're still mixing it. And we go into the studio and there's a pile of boxes like that. They've done 36 mixes and they've all got stars by them. Which one's the best? Because well, they've all gone on speed, see? Everybody's out there fucking in. So they've got stars by them. And let me verify, this was the funniest story in the world. And uh, of course they couldn't remember. They said, well, this one's got four stars, but we think this one with the three stars is better. And this is in a pile like this. So that's why we had to go to to Olympic and remix it. And um, the rest really is history. Ted put the record out and it did quite well. It got into the t top 40, I think, maybe even top 30, I don't know. He did very well for us, you know. He, he saved Motorhead. Without Ted Carroll, there literally wouldn't be one in Motorhead because we were, like, going to resign. Well, I resign, been, I resign. Well, we've been d digging and stuff and working like dogs and nobody seemed to be... We had lots of, we had a following, but it didn't, yeah. without getting a record deal, it didn't seem worth it, you know. We were yeah. having to deal dope and living in squats. And Both of them came through every gig, like. You know. Do you know when there's a drummer at the door? He doesn't know when to come in. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Phil, Phil, don't blow it, man. Don't punch the fucking producer. Don't throw a wobbler, kick your kit over and run out the door, because that's what he used to do. And the session would be gone. We've got one day, you know, and Phil would blow it by fucking throwing a wobbler. I mean, they talk about me, but Phil was um, fucking believable A lot of fun as well, but uh, this was serious. So we did the single, they brought it out, and there's this classic story of me. And um, they brought it out, and it went into number 73, I think it got, or something. And fucking sure enough, we were on top of the box. Which for us was unbelievably funny, you know. Top of the fucking box, you know, you've gone from here to this weird place over here, you know. <laughs> but of course, we, we weren't going to turn it down. Anything, anything but as far as we could turn at that time. So we did Top of the Pops. And you do it on a Wednesday. On Thursday, I was doing with Jimmy O'Neill again. I was doing a bit of painting to get a few quid, you know, to eat. And uh, I'm playing in the way, and it's fucking seven o'clock. And I said to the people who work with me, I said, listen, I said, it's all right if I watch the fucking telly. I'm on in a minute. <laughs> so I'm, I'm watching myself on top of the pops with a fucking paintbrush in one hand, you know, with the fucking overalls all covered in paint. And there I am on the telly playing Louis Louis. And then they said condescendingly, well, maybe we should do a few tracks, do an album. So Jerry gave us this really shitty deal. But it was a deal. We didn't care. We just wanted to make a record, you know. And we'd written a few more tracks by then as well. Because um, we'd done a John Peel show. And we did four tracks on there. We did White Line Fever, Keep Us On The Road. I don't think we did White Line Fever. But we did I'll Be Your Sister, which was one of our next tracks that we wrote. Uh, then I think we did Damage Case. And we had practically Overkill was written. Because once we had a, a go, we were keen as mustard, you know what I mean? They were just flowing out. It was fantastic, all this pent-up stuff. We could write songs like that. It was brilliant. I always wanted to play two, two bass drums, but uh, I, I always said to myself, no, I'm not. I, I'm not going to I'm not gonna be one of these wankers who goes on stage, you know, and has two bass drums and never even fucking plays them. But not until I can play them. So I, I, I got this other bass drum, and I used to get to rehearsals a couple of hours before the other guys and just practice, you know. Just sit there going, <laughs> basically like running or something like that, and uh, and that's how Overkill, that's how the song Overkill came. I was actually doing that, playing that riff, you know, just trying to get my coordination right. When Eddie and Lemmy like walked in, and 
I was, I was just about to stop, and they went, no, 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 don't stop, keep going, keep going, and put the, you know, and Lemmy came with it. I mean, that was how Overkill got written. <laughs> Me, Eddie, and Lemmy would play, like, as if it was a live gig. And um, w once, once the drums were down, then they'd lose, you know, they'd lose the bass and the guitar. So in other words, they, they could afford to make mistakes, you know, I couldn't. I mean, there was, on, a, on all of our stuff, there was never any overdubs on the drums. All the drums were all live. There was never any cheating done. Wish we could say the same for the bass and the guitar. <laughs> well, we had, what was it, 32 tracks, I think, on the set, on Bomber, 16 on Overkill, I think. Whatever it was, we used them all, you know, like there was fucking claves and shit on there. So 24 of them on the drum kit. Nah. No, we, uh, we just went in there and played it live. Overkill, we played them live. Oh, your tongue's got a funny colour, Phil. Yeah, let me help you. There you go. This is a very good tongue, Phil. Oh. Have you had it long? I've eaten my own tongue. <laughs> yeah, I'll save you a chip. I'm smoking my own shit. No thanks. I remember seeing Phil Taylor trying to get out through a hotel revolving door, which took about 25 minutes. With his dark glasses on, that was funny. Talk about in through the outdoor. I mean, that, that was pretty wild. He tried to get out through his hotel bathroom mirror. He thought it was a window. He couldn't. He was so drunk he couldn't open the door. So he tried to get out through the mirror. And the police were called in the hotel at the Park Sunset opposite the Hyatt House. That was memorable, very memorable indeed. Okay. Oh, I see Phil needs to be milked. <laughs> so, so, somebody milk Phil, will they? Jimmy Miller was one of them names that used to come up. You know, you all, everybody go, oh, Jimmy Miller, you know. So, um, so of course, uh, we didn't realise quite what, you know, what Jimmy had been through in his life. Because <laughs> by the time we got him, he was a bit sort of used goods, you know. But it was still kind of good. He always wore this like long cardigan, you know, with, with like handkerchiefs, with, with big boogers out, you know, like old fashioned. And he'd come in and he had like, I'm sure one time he came in, still had house slippers on and it was snowing outside, you know. And he looked as if somebody had magically lifted him up from in front of the TV and the fire at home and like transported him into the studio, you know, and he'd get there and he'd come in, and he'd have his hands in his pockets and he'd sit down behind the desk and then go. He used to do things like, you say I'm popping, he'd go to the fucking bathroom, he'd gone for three hours. I mean, you couldn't find him. He said, well, where the fuck's he gone? It wasn't until afterwards we found out he was going in the ladies' bog and fucking having a bit of thingy and passing out for fucking two hours. We never thought to look in the ladies. We used to think that we were bad at being late, but he would be like half a day or, or, or even more late, you know, and his excuses were marvellous. You know, like he'd fuck up and be five hours late, we'd all be sitting there going, bastard, you know, and then he'd show up and he'd go, guys, you can't believe what happened. I remember me and Lemmy saying, no, we're probably not, but we're dying to hear it. It was snowing because it was it was a winter snowing, and the cab never showed up, so I had to call another one. That took another hour, and then we were on the way here and it ran out of gas. And he's had to push it to the station, to the petrol station. And then we got stuck in the snow. It was terrible, and he'd been outside rolling about in the snow to you know, like look tragic, you know, because we saw him doing it, you know, at the window. It was fucking hopeless. At least he invented a decent story, like you know, I, I give him for that. God rest him. He was a lovely fella though. He was a lovely fella. And I, I guess we owe him a lot really, because I tell you what, Motorhead wouldn't have been an easy band to record. In fact, virtually impossible, you know. We used to have rucks with old Lem, you know. Because we've got a producer and an engineer there and they'd be working away. Then Lemmy would lean over and push the bass up. <laughs> I mean, Phil would go, fucking hell Lem, what's the point of having a fucking dog and barking yourself, you know? We've got paying all this money for a producer and you're interfering. You know, it was really funny. We used to have some great rounds. You know, I had a couple of good fights in the studio too. Well, what's 12 inches long and white? Nothing. What's 12 inches <laughs> what? 12 inches long and white. 
Love it. Ho 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 I like the one about the oh. Jap I like the one about the Japanese guy, you know the uh, supplies. Oh yeah. What you what do you do? I mean supplies. Walking to the factory. Supplies! <laughs> <laughs> Vic was great, he was the first one to t tell us we were all cunts and work harder, you know. Like, he had this very dry persona. Is that really the best shot you've got, you know? Like, to come out yeah, and he said like a fucking dormouse. Yeah, right. he looked like a, we used to call him the turtle, because he looked like, you know. You see photographs of him, you'll see why. Even if he was angry, he would be angry like this. Don't, um, you're not doing, supposed to do it like that, or stop that, boys, or, you know what I mean? Bonner and Loverkill both went in the charts, you know. We knew we couldn't fail then. We was on, like you say, a roll. I think it was a Queen Bun, actually. Financially, it was going down, because, you know, the more, we, the, more, the more famous we seemed to get, the more we were working all the time, and, and uh, we just never seemed to see any money, you know. But, that, this was a uh, Doug Smith's, you know, the, this is how you know you're being ripped off. When they work you like dogs and, and they hardly give you any time off. Because, you know, when you've, when you've got a bit of time off, you might start thinking about things, you know. I'm sure that's the way he planned it. Then the promoter comes in, he's going, <laughs> everything all right, guys? And I, I think... Lem just threw a fucking tree at him, at this promoter, and he, ah. he kept lying to us about the distances involved in Norway, so we had to keep hiring boats to take us up the fields, it was fucking fortune. You know, so finally we got him. We sorted out a pair of handcuffs, which all the crew have anyway, from previous, previous uh, engagements. And then he was on the side of the stage, it was his hometown as well, Trondheim. <laughs> oh, Trondheim. Trondheim, and the, uh, he was leaning on the PA, you know, and two of the roadies handcuffed him. He's just on the side and he's, he's going, he's ripped us off, and he's told us lies all fucking weak. And he's there tapping away, he's got his wife and his three kids there, like, tapping away like that. I, give, I, I, I arranged it actually, I, it was Goom, the old drum tech, I said, Goom, now, and straight away, he's brought on stage, we, we had him handcuffed like this, and we had his fucking trousers pulled down to his ankles, and we sprayed in cream cheese like this. All of his family are there looking aghast. And, uh, Graham Mitchell was a tour manager at the time, and he's saying, this is the motherfucker which should charge you fucking so many fucking dollars for the show tonight, and I'll be late. This fucking cunt like this. <laughs> and he shuffled off, you know, a little tiny dick like that. Got a penis like a fucking, like a top of a fucking camera lens, you know, like that. And he's there, he's, he's just flaccid as fuck. And then he went and got in a, in a taxi like it and went to the police station and brought the cops back. And they arrested some of the crew, like myself, everything, handcuffed and the usual stuff. Well, what happened? We said, well, he fucking, he fucking told us. He told us lies all through the tour, man. He was fucking ripping us off and telling us bullshit and whatever, like this. And then this huge fucking Norwegian copper coming, he says, I, uh, I think you have done something very terrible to this person. I, I said, yeah, well, he kept, you know, fucking. He said, yes, 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 he said, yes. But this is no reason to cover a man with cheese. <laughs> There's some weird English perversion, right? You know. <laughs> I've got like three original pictures of that at home. Superb. I think we recorded Emma Smith, but there was fuck all to get used on it because it was no good. I never liked playing Emma Smith. It's a terrible fucking sound, you know, on stage. Um, I don't know, you know, it was just like right place, right time, you know. There were, everybody was waiting for a live album from us because it had three studio albums that had been in the charts. So when it came out, it was almost automatic, you know. Uh, I didn't think it would go to number one, but I knew it would go in, like, obviously. I think it summed up an era, too. I think it summed up an era. I think the title was great. Motor had become like an icon of, you know, at that time, Motor was becoming quite cool. We were on the bus doing something, having a party, 
Oh, that's right, yeah, we because we, we had all the booze, you know, from the gigs we'd done, was on the bus, and uh, we didn't have, nobody had any money left, we were all broke, so the bus was parked outside the front, so we got the keys off the driver, he'd had it fixed, we started up the Jenny and nice air conditioning and that, and then our uh, Graham Reynolds, Lemmy's road uh, guitar tech, came bounding down from the hotel saying, he was the only one in there saying, here, yeah, chaps, chaps, I've just had a phone call from uh, Doug Smith, guess what? Your album's gone straight in at number one. And we all went, ha, 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 that's really funny, Graham. And he went, no, really, straight up. And we didn't believe him, so we, we went back into the hotel and phoned the manager and he told us it was true. It was the most sickly fucking review I think I've ever read on the Melody Maker. It was, well, from being the worst band in the world in the Melody Maker, suddenly we're the fucking God's gift to music. Suddenly the sun shines out of our ass overnight. And I'm thinking, this is sick. How can one day we be cunts and the next day we're fucking, you know, God's, God's answer to the music bit, you know? It was, I found that a bit over the top. I think it, it, we actually got in the Guinness Book of Records for being the only, the only heavy metal band to go straight into the British charts at number one. There was another thing on the radio that happened. A guy played it in the morning. He's played Motorhead. He says, all right, he took us off halfway through and says, Fucking hell, that's a bit much this time in the morning. They had so many complaints that he had to play it all the way through the next day. I saw a great cartoon, actually. Two nails talking, right? And there's a nail head in the plank behind him. And this one says, I know, I was talking to him a minute ago, and then there was a loud bang, and I turned around and he was gone. <laughs> Fucking excellent. We weren't ready to do an album. Well, I don't care what anybody says. That album was forced upon us because Jerry needed the money for his record company. So he needed us to come up with some product. Well, they pushed and pushed and pushed. Well, we started to do some demo tracks with, with Vic Mayle, who had done the Ace of Spades and the No Sleep album. God bless Vic. And um, Phil had a new drum kit. So we are in the studio, we set up his drum kit and Phil hates the fucking drum sound that Vic Mayo's got him with his new kit. So Phil, because he's a bit weird at the moment, will not work with Vic Mayo again. So we've got no fucking producer. We talked to Chris Tangaridis. He wanted £10,000 up front. This other guy, John Anthony, he wanted twenty grand. And of course, that's where Doug Smith shot himself in the foot. He's only paying us £200 a week. When some cunt says he wants 10 grand to work on our album, that to us is a fucking king's ransom. You can fuck off, man. We're giving you 10 grand. You know what I mean? It, we just, we didn't live in that world. This Doug had kept us in this fucking, we haven't got any money world. So this went on and on. We couldn't agree with anybody. And then one day, Phil turned to me and said, listen, Eddie, why don't you do it? And I said, man, I don't want to do it. I'm playing on the record. And he insists, he says, no man, he says, the tank record's good. He says, you can do it. He says, do it with Will Reed Dick, you know, this guy. And I was very, I'll tell you, I swear to God, I was reluctant as fuck. I was pissed off because we let Eddie produce it. And I wasn't at the time though, fair play. But uh, it became obvious after it was released I sort of sobered up and realised it was garbage, most of it. I mean, there were at least three songs on there that weren't even finished, you know. We just finished them in the studio, like, and cobbled it together, like, and it, it just was a substandard album. But the trouble is, how do you follow a, a live album that went straight in at number one, you know? There's nothing you can do. And then, and then of course, true to type, we delivered a substandard fucking studio album to follow it. It wasn't so much the album, I think it was the attitude the album was made was what made it not good. For me, whenever I play it, I can feel it's not quite right. But not just the songs and that. The songs would have been better had we been working as a unit, you know? But anyway, so the album, and then of course, the record company crying out for this record, got to have it, got to have it, so we give it to them. We do this fucking album cover that we weren't happy with. Doug Smith come up with this idea. Doug wants to make a film, start a film company. So he makes a film to start the Iron Fist tour. So he's using us again to give himself a fucking a foothold in the film business. 
So we all wear these fucking helmets that he's had made and tromp about like cunts, you know, and look like idiots falling around and and dressed in all this fucking gear with swords and shit. Anyway, joke as it was, yeah, so anyway, so that was that. And then Doug comes up with this great idea about the flying stage thing, which was a fucking nightmare. We had the stage that came out of the ceiling with all the amps on it. That got stuck going back up, halfway back up in the Newcastle City Hall. Didn't you get stuck on, at the beginning of the show once? No, we, we come down all right and we got stuck going back up and it pulled the curtains open as well. We were all standing there oh, going, yeah. what should we do now? Like, So, that gig, you can imagine, tank go out, they're crap. Don't know what's happened to them, they're crap. We come on, we're playing songs that the kids don't even know. They haven't got the fucking album, so we're crap. We've got this stupid stage going up and fucking down, so we're crap again. It's not till the fucking encore when we do Overkill, Bomber and Ace of Spades, that the kids come alive. But uh, it wasn't that, that that drove the kids away from us, it was Brian Robertson that drove the kids away. Making another perfect day was fucking torture. Mm. Brian took 17 hours doing a guitar track. It fucking took so long <coughs> compared with the other albums. And then when it was released, everybody fucking hated it. So it's counterproductive, really. The only problem with Brian being in Motorhead was his, was the shorts. <laughs> and literally, right? I mean, people will find this difficult to believe, but it was all down to the shorts. I always thought it was a good record, but like, they just hated Brian. You know, because you don't replace a tall man with like very long red hair and like skinny legs and great hips with a fucking geezer who's dressed in green satin shorts and belly pumps, you know. He's a great guitar player and a great guy, I love him. Hello Robo, how are you doing, you rat, rat bag? And um, he's, he, you know, it was like, he came over to join us at the drop of a hat, so to speak. Um, it was my suggestion, you know, because, I mean, I'd, I'd, I didn't really know him that well, but I mean, I always thought he was, you know, he's one of the best guitar players in the world. When we went out on tour, uh, it was uh, summertime in America, and, like, Brian was wearing these shorts. And he didn't give a fuck, I mean, you know, why should he? And actually, on the stage, in between numbers, he would, he would look over at Robbo and say, and he'd say to the audience, and as you can see, he's still wearing those fucking girly shorts <laughs> or something like that. And Robbo would just go, fuck that. I should introduce him as Brian and Robinson. Yeah, yeah, or, that. or Brian, uh, well, Or our new guitar, the Jewish guitarist, Benny Rubinowitz. Yes, actually. yeah, that's right, yeah. And he's, and he's wearing a nice little pair of shorts tonight, as yeah. you can probably all see. Very and of course, it, the, the audience were all like going, Ooh, you know, in English speaking countries it was like, get rid of the shorts, fuck the shorts. And of course I'd be going like, but it's not the short that counts, it's what's inside that matters. Inside, um, Unfortunately in this instance it wasn't true. No, it was the shorts. But it was just such a stubborn, I mean because you know he said to me, like he said, I wouldn't have, he said, I, I, I would have stopped wearing the shorts if Lemmy had just stopped, you know, going on at me about it. The more he went on at me, but it, the more I wore the shorts. It was a fucking lie, man. Yeah. He was just intent on being Brian Robertson's super guest. Yeah, but you, you know, you, you ruffled his feathers. Right. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Oh, no, that's all right. No, I wasn't. He fucking ruffled no, me. No, I, I was on your side. We just went about it in different ways, you know. He's a dog. <laughs> and I'm great guitar player. And even later, when he was wearing them silly fucking trousers tied up with bits of towel. What the fuck was that? Oh, right, of course, yeah, because he did eventually kind of compromise, didn't he? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. But I mean, you could have looked good on stage. You looked like a prat all the time, yeah. Yeah. 
They're just sitting in a cassette to the management company and stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. And this is rotten. A couple of CDs, with, a couple of singles did with Persian Risk and then they asked me for an audition. I came back from work one day and, and, uh, and the wife said, oh, Phil, uh, you've had a call back from the Motorhead people. Uh, can you learn 15 songs and three songs of your choice by Friday? Like this is on like Tuesday or something. So I didn't have any Motorhead albums. So I phoned up my mate who I knew he had no sleep to Lammersmith. So I'll always be forever grateful for him for that. So I just went up and uh, I can't remember when I actually said I told him to join. I couldn't decide between them, they were both really good. And uh, Phil was more like Brian and Russell was more like Eddie. Like, <coughs> so it seemed like a good idea at the time. And he left the day they were coming up to decide between them. Right? He left in the morning and I got up there. I was the only one in Motorhead for about four hours. No, I like, I like Wurzel and you like Phil Campbell, remember? Yeah, I know, but, but then you left the morning they were going to shoot it out, right? No. Yeah. Once we left, once we made the decision, well, I didn't want to leave you in the lurch, you know. <laughs> I didn't want to leave you in the lurch. Then took uh, me and Wurz on the marquee one night. Not, not the marquee, the Sam Ritz Club in London. And um, and he, he he just left us alone. Uh, we, we knew we had. Uh, we thought we had to battle it out the following day or whatever for um, for the, the, the the top spot, as it's called. Um, and we actually did get, I remember we actually did get talking to him where we were saying, oh, well, oh, maybe, look, look at that, you could play this bit on a song and I could play that and that would be really cool. We'd have some rhythm guitar there, blasting rhythm along with a bass. And I think Lem picked up on this as we got on really, really well at the time. And the next thing we know, uh, we're both in there, like. I wanted to be a professional musician because I didn't want to have to wake up early every morning and I didn't want to have to wear a suit suit and tie every day like so it was it was really good I was ecstatic totally over the sausage I was at the time I just thought you know I had a good talk to myself and thought well maybe it's about time I moved on you know because I enjoyed playing with Robbo so much you know, maybe I'll get a band together with him or something like that. I didn't really have a plan, you know. I think I just came up with it straight away when, when Filthy decided to go. I knew I knew Pete because he used to uh, he used to be friends with a couple of people in Cardiff. So I'd, I'd met him a few times and I, I knew he was a damn good drummer, like. Um, I didn't know him really well, but he was a nice guy and I knew he could play really good drums. So I suggested him to Lem and, uh, believe it or not, Lem said, yeah, let's go, because Lem had already toured with Saxon, like a bomber tour. They'd done like 53 shows in 55 days or something like that. So Lem knew how good Pete was and it was, it was a lot of fun for three years. Smile, smile, smile. Pete Gill, an even keel guy. You want to try and see Pete Gill get on a top bunk? Uh, we used to give him the top bunk on purpose on the bus. Actually, he's like a helicopter. He was trying to, broken down helicopter, trying to get back up the Niagara Falls. Trying to get on the top bunk, Pete Gill. I mean, uh, even keel, if, if you call a guy on an airplane, as the stewardess is coming on to check the seatbelt, getting his cock out, and me having to cover it with my hand. If you call that even keel, I suppose, yeah, he is even keel. I didn't wash my hand for three days. I've, I was in awe of Saxon at the time. It was a left hand. He was in an aisle seat. I was next to him. It was a very creative time. I mean, when, when Pete, um, Pete joined, he was, he'd been out of, out of playing professionally for a, a few years. And, they, and it, obviously, mine and Wurzel's creative juices were flowing and so were Lem's. We did the four tracks for No Remorse. I think it was Snaggletooth, Steal Your Face, uh, uh, Killed by Death. I think that was the third or the second song we wrote in No Miss. And um, what was the other one? Uh, and Locomotive, that's right, yeah. That's right, I, I remember we, me and Lem went to John Entwistle's house one day in Rickmansworth, and we played him uh, Locomotive. And he said, bloody hell, man. He said, you're a drummer. We said, 
all in one take and we said yeah he did it all in one take and John Entwistle couldn't believe it like so that was quite a compliment but um we uh for Orgasmatron it was great I thought I think the production let us down in Orgasmatron the, the um I, the songs were, were really good we, we put a lot a lot of effort into the songs I mean riding with the driver and, and stuff like that and uh a lot of stuff. I just think production let it down. They really cocked it up, you know. I mean, the, the, the rough mixes on that album were great, and then he really cocked it up. Like, took it to New York and mixed it, and come back with this terrible mess. And he brought a case of champagne into the studio, and his manager was standing by the door, determinedly bopping. But it didn't work, you know. And slowly, Phil just pushed the champagne back under the desk with his fucking foot. Like, yeah, another instance of the producer thinking he's the artist, you know. It was like early hip hop type sounds and things like the when hip hop started, and it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't like taking a big shit after a curry, like which it should have been. You know what I mean? It was like pecking at a pack of the peanuts, like which is not what we not what we're at. I'll tell you exactly what happened why Pete Gill left. It was a total misunderstanding. This is 100%, I swear on my family's life, this is what happened. We were doing Eat the Rich recording somewhere, and um, me, and Pete, me, me and Pete were somewhere, and we, we told them, when the cab, when the cab arrives, here we, here we are, we're ready, just tell us when the cab arrives. We'd finished the day's recording for the, for the movie Pete the, Rich, uh, Pete the Rich, Eat the Rich. And uh, the, next, the next thing we, we know, well, Lem's outside screaming in the cab. So, so we go out and, and Lem's screaming at Pete, saying, oh, wait, I've been sitting in this cab for 20 minutes, man, where were you? And, and we, told these, we told two or three people, like, as soon as it is, and then Pete just started mouthing off at Lem. And, and, they just burst up like that, and Pete just walked like that. Lem said, oh, fuck off, and Pete said, oh, fuck off, or whatever, and, and walked. And it was a total misunderstanding. That's exactly what happened. A cock up over a taxi, <laughs> in true motorhead style. The rock and roll recording, um, it was at Redwood Studios, somewhere in London. Uh, the first album was filthy since he rejoined. Um, we recorded it in 12 days. It was mixed in 11 days, and it, it's still. I, I like it. It's it's, a, it's not a great album, but it's, if you're close to it, it there's, there's things on it I like. There's a lot of good things I like. And um, so the studio manager was Andre Yakimin. If you look at any Monty Python uh, things with scrolls with the music, it says music Andre Yakimin. And he, he heard us. Um, we would we always talk Monty Python nonsense like in the studio, we're all big fans of Python. And he said, oh, you, he said, you know who, own, who owns this studio? He said, Redwood Studios. Michael Palin, and we go, what, are you kidding us? He said, yeah, no, this is it, he owns all this. And we said, oh, can, we're all big fans, could you ask him to come down? And when Michael Palin came, that was all, that was so funny. He was dressed in a cricket outfit. Uh, cricket outfit. 30s cricket outfit, aye. He, uh, it was uh, Sunday afternoon, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, he, he was on his way he to a local came, cricket match. Sort of came bouncing in, you know, like with that. Hello there, boys. Hello, you know, chaps. Right? You're Motorhead, are you? <laughs> what sort of thing do you want to do today, then? Yeah, yes, what sort of thing is it? And no, he wasn't, I don't think he was acting, was he? Right? No, I think he's like that. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, what about that old lord? And he said, ah, yes, some cathedral, please. Yeah. Put give, the echo give me chamber some cathedral, yeah. I've still got the outtakes of that. Have you? Mm. Oh, and the trousers. Oh. Bless, bless, bless this by holy motorhead. So they then you get one of the pairs of trousers each. At least one of the pairs. Oh Lord, thou who has seen the translucent and had compassion. Yeah. Look down upon them. In that way. It's fucking good, man. Welcome to the end of side one of this most ahead record. <laughs> yeah. There's two prawns, one called Tom, one called Christian. They're swimming around in shark infested waters one day, and, and Tom he says, oh, I'm fed up of, of being a prawn. He said, we could get eaten at any time. He said, I'd much rather be a great white. And as he said it, a shoal of mysterious cod swam past and said, your wish is granted. <laughs> Straight away, Tom turned into a great white. He thought, oh, this is fantastic, look at that. But 
oh, Christian, his friend, he'd gone off to his house. They're all scared, obviously, a prone scared of a great white. All, all the local prone family and friends, they all scattered. So after two or three weeks now, Tom's swimming around and everything, and he, he he's bored. He can't find nothing to play with or nothing. And he's thinking, oh, God, I'm, I'd rather be a prawn. So, so he said, oh, I've got to find, I've got to find them cod. So, so he's looking around. After, after another week, he finds, he finds his cod. And he says, oh, oh I want to be a prawn. And <laughs> like they swam past him. The wish is granted. All of a sudden, he's a prawn. So straight away, he goes straight up to Christian's house. He's banging on the door, and Christian says, fuck off. He says, no, no, no. He says, I found cod. I'm a prawn again, Christian. One, two, three, four. I love the guy to, to this day. Phil was great. He, he, he sort of took us under his wing for a while. And I, we, um, we got signed to uh, WTG, which was a subsidiary of Sony and Epic. And we, we, did, we recorded um, in 1916 with them. And like, we, we all went to live over there for like six months. Lem, Lem and Filthy decided to stay. I don't think Filthy's been back since, actually. I don't think he can come back, but... Uh, but that, that was a good move. I mean, it made him, uh, a whole new man out of Lem, you know. He'd rather be swanning down Sunset Boulevard, watching chicks in bikinis and walking around Port Portobello Market with it pissing down with rain, so... It took, it took 10 years off Lem anyway, it was, it was, it was great. 1916 was very funny, because we had this guy called Ed Stadium started out producing it. He was a very well-known producer and everything. And then we went in, we played one day, and then we went in the next day, and he was playing us the track back, and I said, what's that in it? And we pulled down all the tracks, and there was like triangles on it and claves and all kinds of weird percussion shit. And he must have been in the night before, in between, and put them on there, because they weren't put on while we were doing it the day before, right? So he must have come in after hours. Because he said he's, he's off home in his car. He must have drove back and done all this shit overnight, right? And we sussed him out and wiped them all off again. Very strange indeed. But there's uh, some good tracks on that. That was really the Renaissance album from Motorhead in 1916. We were over here in America then and uh, it really, uh, it got great reviews, you know, which rock and roll didn't get. In 1916, got great reviews, and it said, and we also played that year the first gig at Hammersmith with the four-piece lineup. So also Phil's birthday, which was good, you know, and uh, they went fucking crazy, you know, Hammersmith went nuts, and so that was a, a good one, you know. My departure? Yeah. Well, it's... Uh, what time is your departure? Um, I'm not quite sure. Do you know what platform it is? I hope the plane's here. Yeah, yeah seriously. It's on though, time. Seriously, though, when you left seriously. the stairs, <laughs> We didn't leave, you were pushed. When I left, or when I left? When yeah. I left the band, I was just... A mere uh, boy. A foolish... A child. Trouserless... What a foolish... Red colored. Trouserless uh, young man, smitten and bitten by wood nymphs and very small maggots. It's not sooner. They were eating away my wooden trousers. The language you said, it's true. It was the hinges, you see. Yeah. The hinges on the knees of my wooden trousers. I got caught in the rain. It atrophied. And you see, the atmosphere. They'd, they'd rusted up so solidly, and Lem refused to lend me the oil can. Yeah, it was and my so oil can. Too. I said, I'm going to leave. You fucking oil can, I said, to him. I said, if you don't give all my, my wooden trousers, I'm going to leave. He said, how are you going to leave if you can't fucking bend your knees? If you can't walk. I so I jumped. So I hopped, I left, I left like this. You left. Yeah. <laughs> and so the oil came. It's very limber, you know, it's very... And those wooden trousers, you know what? They're still standing today in the corner where I left it's them. They're still going, yeah. yeah. And they're still rusty, and you still won't give me that. Real oak, weren't they? No, no, no. Maple. Maple? Yeah. Cross-ply. Handy for the syrup. Oh, no, 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 no. No, not syrup. 
Alright. Well, you never got hold of my fucking... Well, basically, when he left, he left and he went and pinched my bird, and he, he, was, he was quite happy. I did not pinch your bird. I, I knew that. She came, round, she came round and fucking grabbed me. I know. Mind you, I was, well, I was better off in the end. You know she's moved back to LA, don't you? Who? Me. Oh, oh. Oh, no. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I she was looking for your number and I wouldn't give it. Aren't I a good guy? Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm going now because you're talking about the other man. The other man, yeah, <laughs> in my life. And we got. Um, I mean, there's no need to rub it in. The first time we asked him, he said no because I'm going to join Dockin. <laughs> we better not talk about him too nicely. No, I won't. Don't worry. Don't worry well, about it. I'm that. going out because I don't want. To, I don't want to start crying. I might hear something I don't want to. So I'll let you know when I've gone. Alright. Have you gone yet? Hang on a minute, she's just put her hand down the back of my trousers. Okay. Alright. Have you gone now? Yes, I've gone now. Sign me a bass. Sign me a bass. Nicky, it was obviously a spectacular drummer, you know. I mean, he went and joined Dockham, which is kind of an aberration of it, some sort, you know. But he did five years with him, and then we asked him again, and he, I got him trapped in a corner downstairs here. So he fucking joined the band, so he joined. I had two options. I had to either replace him or join the band. You know, I, I could not, I could not replace him, and and you know to be. I'm, I'm here instead of Filthy Animal Taylor, you know? I'm, I'm gonna, it's like an extra dad or something, you know what I mean, or a mom. <clears throat> because I had to join the band and do my shit. I had to change the band. I had to uh, play differently, look differently, just be differently. Either I got accepted or I didn't, you know? I remember coming to London the first time, playing. A lot of people said, who is that fucking California fucking wanker that I've got in the band of Pulsar? Fucking, I mean, my hair was down to my ass, blonde, fucking, you know. I smelled good, you know. Which was a fucking, you know, difference to begin with. <laughs> people thought it was weird, because like Doc and were more of a poser band, and we were more of a, non-poser band, sort of the opposite ends of the spectrum. He was blonde, we were dark hair. He wore, he wore aftershave, we didn't. So, I, I remember London, it was, uh, man, if, if they could kill me, I would have been, you know, I was, I was walking into Hammersmith and, and it was like, wow, these fuckers want to fucking kill me. But we did the show and, and the same people that looked really fucking angry at me, before the show, he stood in line to shake my hand afterwards. You know. The first tour he did was a big tour, actually. It was Operation Rock and Roll with Judas Priest, Airline and Cooper, good old Alice there, uh, us, Dangerous Toys, and Metal Church. It was like six weeks in big, big venues in the US. And it worked out great. And Mickey's been with us uh, for 14 years since that, I think, yeah. If I compare this stuff to King Diamond or Dawn or whatever I've been playing, but this is the hardest shit you can do, really. I like my drums to, uh, I mean, I, I explain it like this. I, I can overplay these songs. Very, very simple, easy. I can do drums all over these songs and show how damn good I am, you know? With a million fucking things. But that's not Motorhead. I'll destroy this, <laughs> this music. I never want to do that. I like to keep it really straight and heavy. And when the shit gets there, it's supposed to taste good. You have to choose your moments. Less is, is a lot more in a band like this. A couple of years ago, we went through, I think we went through eight monitor guys and 13 gigs. Uh, cause, like being a monitor guy with Motorhead is, is It'd be easy to reconcile the Russians with the Chinese or make box good of bridges, you know? So this one guy turned up, he turned up, he had his suitcase 
Where's the, where's the new guy? He turns up at soundcheck but on the stage with his case, introduced to us all. He says to Emmy, now I think I've heard what the problem is. It's the 3.5K, he's down with the, with the, with the 15 k- kilohertz, but then he said, he's fired. And the guy, we fired him on the spot like that, like too much fucking technical shit. Guy didn't even make the dressing room. He'd gone. Another guy we found making wedding invitations on his computer when he should have been taking down our feedback instead of welding us with the fucking feedback. So he went. It's like being president of the fucking Philippines, man. Being a monitor guy with us. We've done many, many fine albums, but Bastards, I think... I think Mickey and Lem are in agreement with myself. It's... it's uh, it's the finest. I mean, we worked so fucking hard on that. The songs, the songs were there. The commitment was there. The playing was there. The production was there. Everything was there. I mean, we put Howard Benson. He was in a. Um, we gave him a nervous breakdown after three weeks, and he, he came on to do another three albums with us. I mean, that's fucking. How pussy is that? No, no, it's not pussy. Actually, come to think of it, no, it's just hardcore. Howard was great. But um, yeah, we spent a lot of time on Bastards, and uh, I'm so proud of that album. Nothing wrong with that album at all. Some great songs. I always feel we should have sold the song "I'm the Man" to Aerosmith. I can imagine Steve Tyler swinging around his Tourette's. Oh, no, they're not called Tourette's, they know. Oh, sorry, Bastard. Oh, sorry, well, this. Is it? I think Tourette's must be catching. I don't, I'm not quite sure. Well, where's the left during Sacrifice, really? I mean, he left just after we'd finished it. And he only played one solo on the whole album, and he was really... He was, he was gone already, really, before he started that album. His input was, like, very, you know, minimal. It's a shame about Wurzel. He started to believe the wrong people. You know, because I was his best friend in the band and off stage. you know, I was his best friend, and he didn't believe it anymore. He started accusing me of stealing his money and shit, you know, I mean, I need Russell's money, you know. I mean, I got all that money coming from Auckland before and the motorhead before him, you know, I didn't need his fucking money, you know. And I wouldn't have stolen it even if I did, you know. I'm not, it's not like me, but he, you know, there he goes. You make your choices, suffer the consequences, you know. It took him like six hours to try and do a solo with this one song on Sacrifice. In the end, he just fucking slammed the guitar down and legged it, took the guitar with him. And that, that was basically it. I remember when it happened. It was both panic and satisfaction at the same time because Versa was also very tired of this, and we were very tired of it. It's a mutual thing. I miss him tremendously as a as a guy, but not as a guitar player. In the end, he he was no good. In the end, it was just the bottom line, and uh, he didn't like it. He, he didn't play good because he didn't feel good. But some copies of Sacrifice have got the three of us on there, and some have got four. I don't know if anyone's got, probably, your fans out there, you've probably got a copy of both. And you probably know all this anyway, but I'm going to tell the camera for those, an initiative. An initiated, I'm sorry. I've been drinking for four since 1973, so you have to excuse me. And then, of course, here we are as a three-piece with, you know, Phil and I go, oh my God, you know, Phil's going to do this on his own. I remember me and Lem talking to Phil and said, you know, what's up? Are you going to be able to, you know, carry this? And he said, this, this is fine, you know, don't worry about it. And I said to Lem, don't worry about it. Are you, is he fucking kidding? You know? I was confident that we could, we could carry it out as a three-piece. And I, I said to Lemma Mick, I said, look, I said, look, let's rehearse, let's try it as a three-piece. I said, and, and if it's, it ain't done working, if it's not working, I said, believe me, I'll be the first one to say, we need to get someone else in. And we had a German tour coming up. So the first, we said, all right, we'll give you the German tour, we'll see how it goes, you know. And the first night, this thing flashed past me during the first song, and it was fucking Phil Campbell. I'd never seen him move more than two feet on stage before. This, doing all these gyrations and shit, and it was, there he was, you know, he did very well. He proved us so wrong, first show, you know. He was running around, I mean, from being the more musician standing on his same place playing, Versa was the 
the headbanger, you know, the wild one. He come flying up to me all the time on the drum rise, and, you know, and Phil was always more concentrated and playing the right stuff, carrying the band musically, in the, if you will, out of these two guys. And now suddenly he's running around being completely nuts on stage and played so good and and he has just grown into that role more and more every year, you know. The best joke for 2004 was uh, two cannibals eating a clown and one says, does this taste funny to you? It was a great album, I liked Overnight a lot. I was very pleased with that. Snake by Love was, uh, had two turkeys on it, you know, the last two tracks, but we were, as usual, working under the fucking clock, you know. And I, I've got people coming up to me saying there's uh, two favourite tracks, you know, so what the fuck? Oh, yeah. Don the gay bus driver. Oh, that faggot. Oh, Philip. Oh, Philip. Oh, my machine. He was drunk, you know. <laughs> he, he got drunk, this gay bus driver, and he was after his ass. He's like, Philip, Phil, Phil. That's why I, I remember. He tried to get in his bunk with him and he gave him a kick. I'd forgotten all about him, yeah. I remember. Yeah. He, we got rid of Was him. it Don? Yeah, Don. What is it with this microphone and me? I mean, is it... You're just not photogenic, I suppose. I think um, We Are Motorhead was a much better album than it got credit for. Hammered. I kind of ambivalent about it. It's up and down, Hammered. There's some good tracks on it and there's some crap on it, you know. But um, Inferno was very good. I'm very pleased with that. It's not a religion, it's like promoting fun or we don't harm anyone you know if people if people somebody comes up to me and says I fucking hate your guys music but you seem like really nice guys I don't know nothing about your music whatever I, I, I welcome that I shake their hand you know it's better than somebody coming up and bullshitting because we don't care as long as there's two types of people nice people and people who fuck you over like and um, we go around the world playing our, our stuff and, and we enjoy it, and lots of other people enjoy it, and there's no reason to stop, really. Not so when we're long gone and people are going to try to copy our music. I mean, really copy our stuff. When they do, they realize how hard it is. But we're not going to come across like Rush or King Diamond or... Um, they, they, ju they just doesn't, they don't get it right away. You have to live this, this band and then you realize how hard it is. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And uh, like for Lem, Lem is not a typical, you know, Geddy Lee and Rush is Geddy Lee and Rush. You know, you don't think Lem is a bass player, but he really is a bass player. He's a tremendous bass player. He goes out there and rocks fucking harder than anyone I ever played with and uh, he's just uh, he blow he blow me away in so many other ways you know than just a technical bass player with his fucking bass shoved up under his you know chin that's not all that's just a little little bit to be a complete musician and, and, and a bandmate you know there's so much more them is tremendous and Phil is Incredible, and, and I'm pretty fucking good too. <laughs>